Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome back to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today is financial strategist, best-selling author, and nationally sought-out speaker, Mark Murphy. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. I could uh, be more pleased to be anywhere. Absolutely. We're so excited to have you on the podcast today. And before we really jump in, I was hoping that maybe you could take a little, just a few minutes and give us a little bit of information about your background and then what it is that you do now. And tell our listeners who may not know Mark Murphy just a little bit about you. I'm a guy that grew up dumb and broke and suffered in New York and just just never got outworked. And, uh, you know, I think that when I, I started my firm, 38 years ago, Northeast Private Client Group, this was my vehicle to make other people's lives better. And so it's uh, it's just been this uh, great uh, joy to uh, to see it grow and to, to see how many people we've helped. And as I said, I spend most of my time as a key business strategist, critical thinker, financial advisor to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial thinking people. And I think we're known as the firm that helps people create multi-generational wealth. And the ones that have it, we make sure they protect it and keep it because so few of them do. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Talk to us a little bit. You mentioned your financial group. Tell us a little bit about, obviously, what kind of inspired you to start your own financial services company and the types, of, the type of work that you do, the type of clients that you work with. It became clear to me growing up, and I mentioned I grew up dumb and broke and not having enough abundance of finance when I was growing up. And it just seemed clear to me that so few people actually created any wealth. And even the people that were making a lot of money, the money didn't stick to them. You know, one of our verticals, it's not the primary thing we do, but, you know, I work, I'm an NFL registered player financial advisor, and I work with a lot of celebrities and athletes, although it's not our primary thing. We, we mostly work with people in manufacturing and private equity and a few verticals like that to healthcare. But I think that the idea is that it just seemed to me that there was an article that came out in Sports Illustrated many years ago that said that 81% of professional athletes were either bankrupt or in severe financial distress within two years of retirement. And I just insisted I would only work with the 19% and try to expand that. And then I started to take a look as I was a young advisor and I, I started to see that not that people making the kind of money our clients were making were going to be bankrupt or in severe financial distress, but many of them worked a lot longer they had, many of them lost their fortunes. Uh, many of them continued to make one bad decision after the other. And the clarity piece came to me when I, I had a meeting with a big, let's call it a big four accounting firm. I'm not going to mention the name because I don't want to hear from their lawyers. But I had sat down with them and I had sat with them as a very young advisor. And I sat down with them and they were talking about a typical client. They were talking about a 35-year-old business owner and some things they would do for that this business owner. And they were, people ideas would go back and forth. And then they were talking about a 50-year-old business advisor. Things went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then a 65-year-old business owner. And then an 85-year-old, and it went back for three quarters of an hour, and I was involved in this presentation. And it was you know, raucous. People were yelling things out. It was like a, being on the trading floor on you know, in the New York Stock Exchange. And then I stepped back from the board, and it appeared to me that a lot of the things that people were recommending at 35 and 50, that all the problems they solved at 65 and 85, they created at 35 and 50. And what they had done the same planning, if they knew the 35-year-old would become the 50-year-old, would become the 65 and hopefully the 85-year-old plus. And it just occurred to me that there was an awful lot of bad advice out there. And there was, it was all short-term thinking. And there was no real strategy or plan in place. And it just inspired me. I thought there was a, a real void in the vertical. Absolutely. Is that one of the things that inspired you to write your book? What inspired that? And can you tell us a little bit about, for our listeners, what can they expect? So the name of uh, the book is The Ultimate Investment, A Roadmap to Grow Your Business and Build Multi-Generational Wealth, which obviously, you know, banks on what you have just talked about. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write the book and what kind of information we can get from the book. 
obviously, since we've trademarked our pyramid to creating multi-generational, we've put together that roadmap. But I think the the idea is, as I said, I'm, I don't know about you, Katie Beth, but I'm always at my best when I'm serving others. And that was, I could have chosen a lot of different fields or a lot of different places to make a difference in the lives of the people we touch. But I find that's the great joy, the mitzvahs and the giving and the ability to make a difference in other people's lives. And I get such a kick out of that. And the very fact that they pay me, I have to tell you, I cannot believe with the way I grew up, the amount of money that I get paid to ask people questions. I have a business that all we do is whoever asks the most powerful questions wins. And there are people paying me tens of millions of dollars to ask them questions. What a great country this is. What a great uh, place. And and uh, and they're happy to pay it. So I, it's, it's a win, win, win. And it's, you know, every day is just a, a joyous day in my life. Because uh, at the point now where if it, if it doesn't seem like fun, I'm not going to do it. Which is why I did no. this podcast, because it seemed like fun. And it is fun. We we do have a, a lot of fun here. And and I I think feel like Stan and I come from the estate planning world. And we can definitely piggyback on everything you said about it's the joy of waking up and really getting to, uh, yes, you can make money and all of those things, but really getting to change people's lives for the better with the simple information that we have and the simple service that we're able to do. Having that ability to make that impact for generations is really the reason we do what we do. I love that you very much kind of echo that with everything that you say. You you get paid uh, money to do one of the things that you really love to do. So I love that. Stan, I've stolen all the questions so far. You go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, Mark, I, I don't know your background, but, you know, I, I grew up on a farm and we didn't have any money out in rural Arkansas. And I would say the same thing. I can't believe I pinch myself every day when I realize the opportunity I have to really make an impact in people's lives and get paid for it. It's, it is a great country. And I think about that. Uh, I think about that every day. I was really struck by something you said that I read about you, where you said you discovered that as long as your business depended entirely on you, it wasn't really a business. It was really a job. And if something happened to you, the whole thing would crater. That was an insight I also had. I remember the moment I had it, I was lying on a beach in Hawaii and I had some has had the time to spend that day thinking about what my office overhead was back at the office when I wasn't there. And that's when I realized I had to change things. I'm curious to know how that epiphany happened to you. But more than that, what action steps you began to take to bring about change in that so that the business that you have is no longer all about you and all dependent on you. As I said, I think that I was very prideful to think that when I, in my, when I was in my 20s and 30s, maybe even to my early 40s, that I always considered myself an entrepreneur and very entrepreneurial in my thinking. And what I realized is, as I'm looking back on my business, even though I owned a business, I really wasn't an entrepreneur. I bought myself a job. Now I was making, it was a well-paying job. I was making a lot of money doing that. But I realized if if I got sick, if I died, if I went to witness protection program for six months, I would, you know, the business would, if not cease to exist, it, it would certainly crater at the very least. And so I realized that I was not getting paid for what I knew. I was getting paid for what I do. And once you make that transition from getting paid for what you do to what you know, that was the beginning of it in changing my mindset and sitting down and realizing that what was very clear to me, the other thing was getting clear to me as I was talking to my clients who were getting to be what would be considered like normal retirement age, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, whatever the number that was appropriate for them is, it became clear to me that entrepreneurs never retire. And so you have to be able to grow and scale your business because an entrepreneur is only happy if they're in creation and fascination mode all the time. They're bored otherwise. And it ultimately, it allowed me to then think, not only do I want to create maximum abundance and that, and wealth for people, and wealth not just in dollars, but in wealth and abundance in every area of their life, but ultimately I wanted to create a life by design. And I wanted to create a life for myself and everybody that I cared about so that they not only would create a life they never had to retire from, we could help them create a life that they never would have to take a vacation from because they were just moving from something they liked to something they liked better to something they liked more than that. And that's always been my aspiration. I think we get there most days, but it's always a work in progress. And I've tried to help as many people as I can to have the best life that they can. And and that's across the board. What are your insights about how to do that? It starts with, to me, that 
you have to have cash confidence first. You have to have cash confidence in your life in the sense that to me, a, a lot of the wealth I've created is when I had money and somebody else needed money. And also when you have a bad quarter or a bad year or there's a downturn, that you have enough cash to withstand that downturn. The one, the number one reason why businesses and people fail or do not succeed to the level they should succeed is they don't have cash confidence. So I want to start with helping people get cash confidence. I think the second thing for most people who are business owners, and by the way, being an entrepreneur does not mean you have to own a business. It's a mindset. It's entrepreneurial thinking. But the second level to me is that you want people to invest in their money machine. So for people that own their business, if you only have $1 to invest, the first place I look is to invest in your money machine. And if you're an entrepreneurial thinker, but you don't own a business, if you're the product, do you have the education? Do you have the network? Do you have the skill sets, the technology to be able to get to that next level in your entrepreneurial pursuits? And then I move, I want to then say after that, I want to, I, I, as somebody who manages billions of dollars, I do not, I never want to say there are only two asset classes, but for our purposes, there are only two. I call them paychecks and either free capital or play checks. And I want our clients to have a series of assets that will give them either a guaranteed or a highly reliable stream of income to replace their income and their money machine. But I also want them to have another series of assets where they can spend it, they can save it, they can give it away. But the important thing is it's not responsible for producing income for their family. So if you have both paychecks and playchecks, that's financial freedom. But then the last level is to have the next level to creating multi-generational wealth is that if they've got an operating company, let's have that operating company long beyond the time where they're working in the business. That it became clear to me that if you had just a million dollars of EBITDA, that's like having $20 million in the bank earning 5%. And so many people have a million dollars of EBITDA, they'll go sell their business at 60 or 65 and they'll sell it for $5 million and pay off some debt and pay a lot of income tax. And then they'll come to somebody like me and say, replace that million dollars a year and they say, can you do it? I said, absolutely. As long as you only, if you're terminally ill and are going to die in the next two years, we can do it because you're giving me $2 million. You want to produce a million of income. And my, my thinking is that you want to have, you know, that I'm not making a political statement uh, far from that, but one of the reasons our former president, Donald Trump, he didn't sell his business when he became the president of the United States. Most people that create wealth have multi-generational businesses. They don't sell it just because they're no longer actively working in the business, they continue to own that business and produce abundance for them going forward. So that's my long-winded way of saying that's my roadmap to help them create that multi-generational wealth. So you have conversations with clients in an effort on occasions, I guess, to talk them out of selling it, but to keep it and grow the team so that the business continues to produce for them while they're knocking around Europe. And I would say the other thing is, and I think there's plenty of room for, and we manage, as I say, billions of dollars in stocks and bonds and other vehicles like this. But Bill Gates was on your podcast. You mentioned him earlier in your question is, Bill Gates wouldn't say I'm worth $110 billion because my 401k or my mutual fund. The true wealth is investing in your business or some other operating company. It's investing in real estate. It's financing deals. I'll leave out divorce and inheritance. And that's how real wealth is created in the country, in this country. It's not by putting money into a, a SEP IRA or an ETF. Most financial advisors that I know really encourage their clients to sell the business because that way they can capture those assets. It becomes assets under management and the advisor gets paid. I'm curious to know, in your business model, how do you do that? Do you have a model that allows you to be, you know, to get compensated by clients that don't sell the business, don't monetize yes. it? Oh, absolutely. In fact, in fact, there's still streams of income to invest from those businesses, maybe not a lump sum of five or 10 or 100 or $200 million to, to manage. Clearly, I think at some point, where is it okay to tell the truth? And where is it okay to always tell people what's in their best interest first when it's not in your best interest? One of the great things I think is that when people trust you like people trust you, Stan, you could probably tell them a lot of things and they would probably do it because of, the, of what you do. But part about it, there's no way to, there's no, in my world, there's no right way to do the wrong thing. And I would never recommend anybody do anything that I wouldn't do in the, in the same situation I was in. And I realize everybody's going to get paid and everybody will get paid some way or another in every field. There's nobody doing this totally charitably. But I think I say, you've got to do the right thing even when no one's looking. 
And I think that's why people search you out. That's why you have relationships that are one of the things I'm proudest of with the business. And our business is pretty big. I'll probably have 10 today, Stan, but I've never had a complaint. And I'm so proud of that after almost 40 years. I'm proud of that. Like one of the things I'm most proud of is, you know, I'd say that's the second thing I'm most proud of is that because you don't have the amount of money that's gone back and forth and the amount of things where life is not perfect and never had a complaint. But if you try to do the right thing every time, and if you do make a mistake once in a blue moon, not an error in judgment, but a mistake, you go, you apologize, you clean up your mess and, and you, you, you make sure it never happens again. And, and so I think there's a way that you conduct yourself that allows you to to to, to have, have a, a joyous experience for everyone. So shifting, let me shift gears a bit here. How does charity philanthropy fit into your life? How do you encourage your clients to incorporate charity philanthropy into their lives? I always say if there's an expression that people say it's you give till it hurts, you've probably heard. Well, I always say if if it hurts, you're not giving enough. Give till it feels good. And I think that the idea would be ultimate to me is I don't want to bring religion into it or people making judgment calls about what you you bring in. But I think one of the great reasons to create abundance in the world is the impact you can have on the lives of the people you touch. And so one of the things that I have a little bit of disdain for people that have just enough, because if they have just enough, they have just enough for themselves and no more for anybody else. And I find them to be very selfish people. But people that create great abundance can make the difference in other people's lives. And I think if you read, Robert Byrne had two, he had a lot of great quotes. There's one inappropriate one that you can delete if you don't like it. I'll give you the inappropriate one first, then I'll give you the appropriate one. But the inappropriate one he used to say is he said, anybody who thinks that a, a way to a man's heart is through his stomach has flunked anatomy. So that's his inappropriate comment. The appropriate comment is he said, the, the purpose of life is a life of purpose. And that's my favorite quote that Robert Byrne has. And so ultimately, that when I think of the charitable, when the charitable, I don't think about getting my name on a building or a platter or that's, which is great. And we've done, got a lot of recognition for the stuff we've done and clients have done. But I think the reason you do it is sometimes you do it just because it's the right thing to do that the, the joy that you get by changing other people's lives and just making a, just a small difference in the lives of the people we touch. And I think if you have not done that, you're really missing out on one of the great joys and purposes in life. Isn't it the nature of humans? Aren't we built to do that? That's part of the D, the DNA material of who we are. And if we're not doing that, there's something abnormal about our life. And that's why we're unhappy or depressed, I've found. When we're not giving our life away and investing it to make an impact in other people's lives. Sometimes I, I go, you know, I believe in we all participate in, or most of us participate in, because you have to in this new world uh, of social media and other things. But sometimes, Stan, I'm not sure. I think that it seems so clear to me, but I'm not sure everybody has that. And I think that there's going to be some people out there that never get it. But I think there's an awful lot of people that through coaching the kind of work that you do and Katie Beth does, that I think that there are people there that just haven't been exposed to it and don't understand that sometimes charitable giving or making a difference in people's lives is about the most fun you can have with your clothes on. It's fantastic. That's a great line. And I thought I'd coin that too, but. <laughs> it's true. Yes. Stan's used that line and that mentality as well. The give till it hurts. Uh, although I like your version better, your version that takes it a step further, Mark, I think I like even better. You mentioned earlier when you were talking about the importance of kind of that morality clause of always trying to do, yes, maybe you'll make a mistake every once in a while, but always trying to do the right thing, which really comes down to that, that builds that level of trust with the people you're working with, your clients and their families. You also have mentioned the idea of the importance of building your own table, which I feel like from what I understand, it's about choosing that inner circle that you're with, that you're working with wisely. Tell us a little bit about your experience with that and your wisdom on that? I think in most businesses, you want to do a few things. You've got to decide who your hero, who you want to be a hero to. And, and basically, I decided about 35 years ago that I wanted to be a hero to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial thinking people. And I've created a business about collaborating with other people that wanted to be a hero to the same group, where that client immediately saw that entrepreneurial synergy and you created an experience that they could only get by working with you. That ultimately, Ren, the, the 15th century philosopher, 
he used to talk about stone cutters and he would talk about the three types of stone cutters. He'd say there's one group of stone, which I think is apropos to every industry. He would say there's a group of stone cutters who cut stone to feed their family. He said there was a group of stone cutters that cut stone because they were artistic and talented at it. And we have many people that are in their jobs are very artistic or talented. That's why they do it. But there was another group of stone cutters that thought they were building a temple for God. And I think when you build your own table, you want to build your table. I want to build my table that want to be a hero to the same group I want to be too. And I want to build a, a, a table of people that want to build a temple for God. And I think that the multiplier effect that I think that there's no substitute for hard work. You've got to work hard, but you can work your l- little butt off and slave for decades and you can grow your business 1x or 2x or 3x. But if you want to grow your ex, your business 5x or 20x or 100x, it's about collaborating with other people who want to create the same abundance. And I think that part of it is building your table, building your table around those sorts of people that inspire you to create something that didn't exist before, or maybe people thought weren't possible. And wow, that gets exciting. If I was, that gets exciting. If I was doing the same thing now that I was doing 40 years ago, I probably would have retired from that. I spent a a college summer or two working on an assembly line and I will tell you, after spending, because I liked the overtime because I needed the money, I was, I was on an assembly line going like this for 12 hours a day, six days a week to make some money to go to college. And by the end of a, a long week, I was you know, ready to take hostages on the roof but by doing that. So if I was not learning and growing and, play, and in creation and fascination mode, I, I think I would, have, I would have retired long ago. Yes. So that's perfect because that kind of brings me to my next question. You you mentioned maybe the assembly line obviously was not the place you belonged where you wanted to be forever. And you've also talked about before and mentioned in some other interviews how you utilize the Ikigai test. So talk to us about that. And how do you, what do you see the kind of the role of the Ikigai test being and how do you implement that with what you do? One of the things that Ray Dialio says is if you read his book, the most recent book that he had written. And he talks about how that the reason why he's the largest money manager in the, in the world or on the planet is because everything's done in a scientific way, but they do human resource things or make other decisions in life based on opinion and, and emotion rather than on science. And I think that ultimately, not that you want to put things through the computer and be robotic about what you're doing, but I think you can blend the two of both science and human emotion together to make decisions. Ultimately, I am, I'm a big believer in, we run our business on EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. I'm a big believer in traction and which Wickman has put out and ways to hire people and keep people I'm, I'm, because I didn't have a model before. I, I couldn't understand why I was hiring these talented people and why they weren't all working out until I focused on that. Um, and, and I think with, with Ikigai, I would say that ultimately it just, the four questions made a lot of sense to me to make decisions. And so a lot of times I, I'm at the age now where a lot of my friends, kids are graduating college or graduating law school or graduating business school or something. And they, they come to me and ask me for some advice. I'm, I'm becoming that guy asking for the advice I did. Now I'm giving, now I'm, I'm asked to give advice. And I always say to them, I put it through that prism and you say, the first question I have is, am I passionate about it? Am I passionate about what I'm doing? I think that ultimately I've never seen anybody really excel for any long period of time in, in anything they weren't passionate about. So if you don't start with passion, how can you be great at anything that you don't passionate about? The second thing is, am I good at it? It might be something I'm passionate about it, but I am not very good at it. I am a big New York Ranger hockey fan. I love ice hockey. I just don't skate very well. So it's not going to not gonna be as passionate about hockey. I, I don't think I, I was meant to play basketball in high school and other sports, not, not hockey. The third thing is, does the world need that product or service? And then the fourth is, can I get paid to do that? And I put that through that prism. And I think for most of us, if it's not just a yes, but a hell yeah to those four, I'd probably take a pass and find something that met my criteria and also gave me a roadmap of what I was looking for. It helps get me clarity on what I want and what my values are and where I want to spend my time. Because the challenge is always time and attention. There's only We're only on the planet. We never get out of this life alive. And there's only 24 hours in a day. Absolutely. Wise words. I love that. Before we run out of time, I wanted to ask you just a little bit about, let's see. So you've mentioned before that you have five key ingredients that you think lead to a successful life. So before we run out of time, could you take just a couple of minutes and talk through 
the five ingredients and tell our listeners what those are and what led you to come up with those five ingredients. Well, you know what is so funny? I, I get asked so many questions all day, every day. I have to say, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed because I can't off the top of my head remember what those five ingredients were or ever saying that. So I write a lot. I, you know, I've written you know, a bunch of, and I'm published almost on a, on a bi-monthly basis, a couple times a month in various periodicals and columns. So when you talk, I mean, could you help remind me the first one? Yes, no, I will. And so this was out of a different interview that you've given. So it may have been a while. So I should phrase like this. There's this very brilliant man who once said that the five ingredients to a successful life are harmony, health, wealth, purpose, and love. That was you. Tell us a little bit about, do you still feel that way? And tell us about that. What what, what I think about is the way I think about it is you get to a place and I think the overarching, and maybe you might substitute a word or two that, you know, Stan, Stan might have one or two words different than my one or two. He, You might have one or two, Katie Beth, different than, than Stan had and vice versa. But I think the, the point you have is that, that as Eckhart Tolle said, and I'll cut it down to a nutshell, is he talks about, and I'm paraphrasing it my way, where he says, when in, in, on this planet and when you leave this planet, you have two suitcases. And the one suitcase is your egoic suitcase. I'm the best estate planner in the world. I'm the best financial advisor in the world. I'm the best bowler in the world, whatever. I'm a vice president of this or CEO of that or whatever I am. And and you can't take that with you when you go and you leave the earth. And he said, there's another suitcase that says, when you realize that who you are is all you've got, then you can decide the kind of person you want to be. And I think that the point is those five words that are there. And I remember, I do not remember saying that. But the point is not that those were the five and only five words, is really the point that sometimes you're in the financial advisory world, everything is measured based on dollars and cents. And my point is that a life well lived is beyond just numbers and how much money you have in the bank. And that ultimately that I think what people tend to do is that maybe you have to have some extremeness to get certain things in life for some period of time. But I don't think it's a well life lived. Like, for instance, does it matter if you're the richest person in the world, if you don't have anybody that loves you? Or is it okay that you're that if you don't have any purpose or harmony in your life, that you have anxiety all day, every day in that place? That does, you know, that, that ultimately I think the point of it wasn't that those five words were the magic words and those were the only words on the planet, is that you look at things in a in a holistic way and you look at things in in, in total abundance. And and sometimes, by the way. As an example, if if I was a professor at a prestigious university as a law professor, and I was educating some of the best lawyers in the country, maybe a law school you went to, Stan, would, maybe I wouldn't be making millions of dollars a year, but would that be a life well lived? Or if I was a researcher in in Bell, in, in, in a laboratory and I helped find a breakthrough in cancer, would my life not be well lived because I didn't have that piece? Or the very fact that I maybe donated some time to my community to, to coach a little league team or to help rebuild the community center? or to, vol- to volunteer at the volunteer fire department. Would that be, would I be poorer just because there was not monetary rewards to that? And obviously in place, I spend so much time all day talking about creating financial abundance, but I think that it would be short-sighted of me to think that was the only measure of success. That is a lot of wisdom and great answer. So thank you very much for that perspective. Stan, do you have anything else for Mark before we run out of time? I know you have lots of questions, actually, but I'll let you narrow the one. No, I, I, you know, I don't have a week. This could last for a really long time. A lot, so much of what you're saying, Mark, closely to, I would say, the wisdom and insights that I've accreted over time, wisdom and insights that I wish I had known you know, 30 or 40 years ago. I wish somebody had told me these things and I had listened to them and incorporated them then rather than picking up in pieces later along the way, but we're getting there. And so what you're saying really does resonate. And we hadn't met before, but, you know, whenever I've talked to guys that say these things and it's the truth of it is so evident for me based on my own experience, it just further validates that we're really on the right track and maybe gaining some wisdom and insight at this point in our lives. That's why we talk about building a table. I want to build a table of like-minded people like like you, who believe who has the same core values. Remember, as Ed Koch, our, the mayor of New York, said he used to say, "If you agree with me seven out of ten times, I want your vote. If you agree with me ten out of ten times, you need a psychiatrist." 
So I don't expect people to agree 100% of the time with each other, but having those same values or the same goals, yeah. I think that's when I talk about building a table. And I think it's always, and it's never over, it's never too late. One of the saddest things I, I think about retirement, whether that be one of the things we do in the, with NFL guys who are now in their late 20s or maybe even or late 30s is they believe when they retire, their life is over. And I go, you only got another 50 years left. I want your career to be more successful after football than it was. Or you talk to a CEO who's now making dinner reservations and going to the dry cleaners and you say to them, Mark, I used to have 12,000 people report to me. But now I'm yelling at the dry cleaner because they lost my shirts. That ultimately in life, there's never any finish line. There's only milestones. And the idea is that that ultimately that everybody has an opportunity to reinvent themselves. And what I try to do, I think our secret sauce is you want to know where people started. You want to know where they are right now. But if you ask what me what my superpower is, is that ultimately you have to see people where they are because if you see where they are, you, you can't ignore people like and pretend they, they're who know they're not. You, it's you can't have rose-colored glasses or Pollyanna-ish. But the idea is, I think my superpower is seeing people at their highest and best use and believing in them so viscerally that they believe in themselves, that that you, you can see them and be be that vessel for possibilities in people's lives so that they can have the kind of life they want to have. And I think that's more important than return on assets or the tax savings that you have or what trust you put them in or what school you got their kid into or what you did. Oh, those are all important things. But the most important thing, I think, is that is about human potential and helping people to be able to reach their full potential. Absolutely. I agree. Well, for everyone who joined us today, thank you so much for listening. This has been the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Our guest today was Mark Murphy, and you can connect with Mark on LinkedIn or at northeastprivate.com. And be sure to check out his podcast, The Hero of the Hour Podcast, for more great insights from Mark and his guest on building multi-generational wealth and achieving financial freedom. Mark, thank you again so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate all of the nuggets of wisdom today. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, Stan. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.